Our scripture this morning is from the, the Gospel of John. It's the last chapter, chapter 21. I'm going to start reading at verse 1. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they replied. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the word of God for us this morning. Well, I don't know about you, but this has been a great week for me. I've been so excited for this last week uh, because school started, and we got to get back into that school routine. During the summer, our routine is thrown all off, and I just kind of get out of whack. Our kids don't go to bed the same time every night. It just depends on what we did that day or what we're doing the next day, and so everything's kind of flexible with that. Uh, we were not always great at uh, planning ahead for lunch, and so they'd be home, and then we're like, oh, we need to get them some food and get those things for them, and uh, just kind of all out of sorts. And now that school's back in, our kids are back into that morning routine of getting up and getting things going. Bedtime is the same time every single night, and so that routine is really good. We're still working on our afternoon routine, figuring those things out, but um, I think we're getting there, and it's good. We're comfortable a lot of times in our routine, in those regular things uh, that we do in our life. It's a comfort zone that we can all get in. And I was thinking of that when I read this passage um, because I see Peter, the disciple, getting into his comfort zone, uh, getting into his routine in this passage. As I said, this was the last chapter uh, of John's gospel. So if we think about where Peter has been, for three years he has been following Jesus. For three years he has uh, left his uh, former job, which was a fisherman. Uh, he left his nets and he began to follow Jesus and has been following him around for the last three years. And I'm not sure how much of a routine there was with Jesus. I'm sure there was some sort of routine uh, as they followed him, but also it seemed like a lot of times um, he had a lot of just drop-in appointments. People would just kind of show up and ask a question or uh, need some healing. And, and so, but yet there was still probably was this routine, but then just recently in the gospels, Jesus was arrested, he was crucified, and he was buried. And so even that, what routine they had with Jesus is gone. And so I see Peter going back three years and looking for a fishing boat. He says, I'm gonna go out fishing because that was his normal routine before that. For many years, his routine was going out and fishing. And if you wanna have some, some fun, some homework, read Luke 5, the first uh, section of that, the first 11 chapter or verses, um, it is Peter's call from being a fisherman to being a disciple of Jesus. And it very much is similar to the story that we just read. So it's interesting to look at those parallel uh, together, but we don't have time to do that this morning. Uh, but, but he was a fisherman, so he's going back to that. And I imagine it's been three years, really, since he was a fisherman, but I bet uh, on that day, as he grabbed those nets, it probably felt like just yesterday. He was out in the boat with his brothers and his father, uh, casting those nets out and then catching those fish. Uh, I bet uh, the further they got out to sea, that his sea legs just kind of came back and uh, were there again, um, because that was his routine for many, many years, and it gave him uh, a comfort to be back in that routine with all the change that had been going on around him with Jesus' death and now his resurrection. And so that's why I see Peter going, I'm gonna go out fishing. I just need something comfortable, some routine that I'm used to. And th some of the other disciples, I think there's seven of them that seem to climb into a boat and they head out into, it says the Sea of Tiberias, that's the Roman name for the Sea of Galilee. And they go out all night and they're fishing. 
and it says when they come in in the morning, how many fish have they caught? None. They caught nothing. Uh, and that might be frustrating, uh, as Kristen was kind of thinking about, it's frustrating to go out and not catch anything. But I also wonder, uh, maybe for Peter, it was just part of the routine again. If you're a fisherman, I would assume that there were nights you didn't catch anything. And so maybe he came back just saying, oh, it was one of those nights, you know. That's just part of the routine. Sometimes you go out and you don't catch anything. That's what being a fisherman, that's just part of that routine. And so maybe that brought even more comfort to him that it's just like things always used to be uh, as they were coming back into the shore. But as they were getting close to the shore, it says a stranger, or it says it was Jesus, but the disciples didn't recognize him, calls out to them, friends, do you have any fish? Um... It says they didn't recognize him there, and I kind of understand that because it says they were at least 100 yards off. I mean, that's a football field. That'd be hard to see somebody and recognize them uh, from out in a boat, and they're on the shore. But then even later in the, the passage, did you hear when they're sitting to breakfast, it said no one wanted to ask him who he was, but we knew it was Jesus, which didn't sound very confident to me that they really knew it was Jesus. But there's something different about him, and I'm assuming that's because uh, he's been resurrected uh, and it has been given new life, and so he's maybe a little bit different uh, from what they experienced before. Uh, but this stranger calls out and says, friends, do you have any fish? And they say, no, we didn't catch anything all night. And the stranger says, well, cast your nets on the right side of the boat. And the next thing in the passage just says, uh, when they did. It doesn't tell us any motivation or any thoughts behind them casting out those nets. And I wonder what they were thinking. As this stranger from the shore tells them where fish are. They've been out all night. They're professional fishermen. They seem to, I would assume they know where the fish are. And then this guy on the shore says, oh, they're right next to you. They're just on the right side of the boat. Cast out your net, and there'll be fish there. And so I, it doesn't say they questioned his command or whether they thought much about it, or I would have laughed to myself and like, yeah, you tell me where the fish are. I'm going to throw this over just to show you there's no fish here. That would have been my response probably if I were them. But when they did throw that net over, uh, over the right side of the boat, uh, what happened? They caught so many fish, uh, they couldn't even get the nets into the boat. Uh, the, the nets were just full. And Peter got so excited that he just jumped in the water. The others had to tow the, the fish into the shore. But Peter, uh, when he and John figured out it was Jesus, dove into the water and swam to greet Jesus. And then verse 9 happens. And this is my favorite verse in, in this passage. It was one that kind of made me kind of laugh and made me kind of question the way I think. And I don't know if you guys can see what I saw, but let's look at uh, verse 9. It says, when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Any of you see what I saw when I read that? Is there anything strange or interesting about this verse? Can you read my mind? What is it? There's fish already on the fire. You see, my assumption, the way I think about things, is I think, well, if Jesus is telling me or somebody else to cast their net out to catch a bunch of fish, uh, a so large amount of fish that they can't even pull it in, that Jesus obviously needs fish, right? Why else would he tell them to cast it out? If he doesn't need the fish, then don't tell him to do that. And yet, he told them to cast their nets out, and yet he already had fish there going on the fire. And, and the way I look at it is, as I'm, may, made me think differently, is a lot of times I think, you know, oh, I have all these great things that, that Jesus needs. I have these great gifts, I have these talents that I get to bring to God, and he needs to use them. And, um, and it's so great, I get to bring those things to him. And what does this tell me? No, nope, not so much. He doesn't need your great gifts. He doesn't need your great talents. He doesn't need you to bring him stuff. He just needs you. And I think sometimes people look at this the opposite way, especially those that, that maybe aren't uh, connected to a Christian church. They think all the church wants or all God wants is my stuff, right? God just wants my money or my time, those kind of things. And we've like, and the honest answer is, no, that's not what he's after. He doesn't want you and your stuff. He just wants you. And not because he needs you or he has to have the things that you have. It's because he wants to be in relationship with you. And so I was like, isn't that so much better? That God doesn't want just me and my stuff. He, he just wants to be in relationship with me. He just wants to care for me and draw me closer to him so that I can follow him. He's not after my stuff and the things that I can bring. He's just after me. And so I, I love that idea that he, he already has fish uh, on the fire. But he told them to cast out their nets. To catch all those fish and then he says why don't you guys grab some of your fish and bring it over the fire and we can have breakfast together and so what it made me think about and realize is that uh, maybe God is calling us to cast out our nets in some way in order to, to bring a blessing something that is beneficial for us uh, a gift for us in order to, to grow in our faith 
on the journey that God has called us in. And, and so this morning, I wanted to invite you to think about what is um, that place that God wants you to cast out your nets to see what you might bring in. Because I think a lot of times in our faith journey that we are on, uh, we get into a routine. We get into a, a comfort zone. We're doing things that, that feel comfortable to us. And um, that's not a bad thing, uh, but it can become a bad thing if we just stay there and we become stale in our faith. And um, we just start going through the motions, just going through the routine. And so I think there are times, and I think this might be a great time to think about, is there something new that God is calling me to cast my nets out into? Is there something I need to add to my routine, add to my faith journey, journey in order to take the next step in faith, uh, to grow closer to God and, and to fall more in love with Him and more in love with other people around me? Because that's something we're going to do all, all of this lifetime. We don't ever get to that end um, uh, in this lifetime, I don't think. There is Christian perfection, but that takes a long time uh, for us to get there. And so I want you to think about today, what is that next step that God might be calling you to? What is that thing that He might ask you to cast your nets out into and see what kind of blessings will come? Um, in our church, uh, we encourage you to be, a, to be a church where we can see Christ. We want to live out our faith, and we, we do that by serving Christ uh, by experiencing Christ in small groups and by embracing Christ in worship. And so I, I wonder if maybe it's in one of those three areas that God might be calling you to cast out your nets and, and see what it is that God might have for you. Uh, if you're doing all three of those things, um, you're in a small group, you are uh, regular in worship here uh, as a group, but also uh, personally, and, uh, and you're serving in ministry, um, maybe you have to cast your nets out a little deeper. If you're not doing all three of those things, maybe there's one that God wants you to add. Uh, to your life and to your faith journey that might help you to go a little deeper in your faith and be drawn closer to Christ. And so I want you to think about what is it that God might be calling you to take one more step or, or to cast your net out uh, into this place uh, for a blessing. And, and one of the things I was thinking of, you know, God might call you to some big step. God may call you to really give up a lot of things, to make a big sacrifice, to take a big step in your faith. But I also want to say that maybe God's just calling you to take a small step, just, just a little step and see what God does and maybe makes a big difference with that small step. Uh, one of the things I noticed as Jesus told them, he said, cast your nets out on the right side of the boat. Did y'all notice that? And, and when Jesus said the right side of the boat, I wondered what would have happened if they'd thrown their nets on the left side of the boat? Would they have missed all the fish if they had cast it on the left side of the boat? And so I Googled first century fishing boats on the Sea of Galilee. And uh, it actually brought up that they had found one not too long ago and, and done some research on it and um, what I found was the largest boats, the largest fishing boats they used on the Sea of Galilee there, um, that the biggest distance from one side to the other on those boats was seven and a half feet. That's the largest distance from one side to the other. And I marked it up here. So if this is the right side of the boat, seven and a half feet is all the way over here. Not very far, is it? Do you really think that there's a lot more fish over there, seven and a half feet away than over here? To me, it's not that big of a difference. That's not that far to go. And when Jesus says, throw your, your nets over the right side, the furthest they had to move was seven and a half feet. And they probably weren't even over there. And plus, they could have been on even a smaller boat. This is the largest boat that they had on that sea. They had to move all the way to the right side and cast their nets out. And so maybe Jesus is calling you to just take that small of a step. Seven and a half feet. Jesus didn't say you have to go to the other side of the sea. That's where the fish are. He didn't say go out to the deep waters, you know, about a mile or two out. No, he said go to the right side of the boat at most seven and a half feet. And there, cast your nets and see what you can bring in. And so I want to invite you to think maybe there's a, a seven and a half step that you need to take that God is calling you to, to, to draw you closer, just a small step in your faith in order to, to be drawn closer to him and to continue to grow in your love of God and your love of others. And so I started thinking of, these are just examples, but things to start thinking about. What is a seven and a half step I might take uh, to grow in my faith? The first one, I think is an easy one. Add seven and a half minutes to your devotion time. If you have a time where you read your Bible and that you've gotten into that routine and things are going pretty well, maybe it's time just to add a little step. Add seven and a half minutes. And in those seven and a half minutes, um, maybe focus on praying for other people. Or maybe in that seven and a half minutes, focus on reflecting on the scriptures that you read. Just take a time to, to reflect and, and meditate on those scriptures. Or, or maybe try a different practice of journaling. Maybe you want to write some things down, whatever you think God might be speaking to you. But just add seven and a half minutes. That's all. That's the step that God might be calling you to. And if you don't read the Bible every day, 
Maybe that's a goal. Just say every day, I want to read the Bible for seven and a half minutes. Don't start with 30 minutes or an hour. Start with seven and a half. And just that's enough to read one chapter usually and think about it a little bit, reflect on it a little bit. Maybe that's just the small step that God wants you to take this fall and say, I'm going to do that seven and a half minutes with my devotion. Uh, maybe if you're not in a small group, maybe you're feeling like God might be calling you to join a small group, be a part of a small group. Uh, maybe you should try that small group for seven and a half weeks. Uh, maybe that's your commitment. Um, because a lot of times if you go to a small group, after one week or two weeks, you, you may not be connecting with people. And that's normal because it takes time to get to know each other. I always recommend six weeks, really, in a small group to, to give it a try. But seven and a half works with my sermon today. So uh, seven and a half weeks at that eighth week, halfway through, if it's not for you, just get up and leave. Just get up and go. You don't have to stay anymore. Pastor James said you didn't have to. Uh, but just commit to give it several weeks, to give it a try, to see what it's about. Uh, maybe that's a commitment. That's, and that's a small step. Just giving up uh, that one hour, one and a half hours uh, each week to be a part of that small group. Uh, maybe in your ministry that you serve in, maybe there's a seven and a half you can find there. I, my thought was maybe there's seven and a half people that you need to get to know a little bit better. Maybe you've been serving people and you don't really know their names, and so you want to get some names, and the half might be a baby or something, you know. Um, but, you know, maybe seven or eight people. I want to get seven or eight names of the people that I'm working with as I serve. Or maybe you want to invite seven or eight people to help you and join you in the ministry that you're working. It's something you're passionate about. Invite seven or eight people to come and be a part of that, to serve in ministry with you. Uh, so maybe there's a seven and a half there in your service. Um, seven and a half in worship again on Sunday morning. I had a hard time coming up with something there too. Um, although I thought, you know, we worship God with our offerings and God calls us to tithe, to give 10%. And, and for a lot of people, 10% is a, a big percentage. Maybe seven and a half percent is a, a number that's more something that you can shoot for. Maybe that's a number that God might put on your heart to shoot for 7.5%. Uh, the average United Methodist in America gives 2.5% uh, of their income to God's work in the church. Uh, I think we're really scared to cast our nets in this area of tithing. And so maybe God's calling you, again, I think take a small step. If you're at 2.5%, you don't have to jump to 10. I don't think God calls you to just jump to 10. He would say move towards that tithe. Say maybe I want to add a half a percent this year or I want to add a percent. And then next year I'm going to add another percent and keep growing as you move towards that tithe that God has called us to. Uh, think about, pray about what is a, a seven and a half step that you might take, a small step to add to your faith journey, to not just stay in your comfort zone, but to try something new and, and cast your nets uh, on the right side of the boat. For myself, um, I bought this little book two weeks ago, and it's my seven and a half step for me this fall. Um, I have prayer time, I have devotion time every single day, and I'm always doing those things, but. I bought this little book to write down my prayers and to have a, a prayer list that I can look at. One of the things I noticed in my regular prayer time is I usually start praying for that issue, that, that problem that's right in my face, you know, that thing that I really want God to work on. I focus on that and I forget to pray about the things that are just always there, that are always uh, needing prayer. And so I just made different lists on some of the front pages uh, of people to pray for. The first one is my family. Uh, they need prayers. Uh, they put up with me. And I sometimes overlook them because I'm looking at all the problems and, and I, I miss them in my prayer time. And so I put them right on my front page and I'm praying for new believers. I'm praying for our church, uh, for our ministries, our staff. Uh, I have a, a page where I'm, I'm praying for people that ask me to pray for them. Whenever someone asks me to pray, I always pray for them right then and there. You know, if I'm on the phone, we hang up, I say a prayer. From at my computer, I get an email, I pray because I, I, I don't want to miss it. But sometimes then I get distracted and I don't come back to that. And so now I'm going to start writing them down and, and get people on my prayer list so that I can come back to that uh, at the end of each day and be praying for them. And so my plan is it's going to add seven and a half minutes is all to my day and my routine uh, of praying. And, uh, and we'll see what God does with that. But that's my step that I want to take. And I invite you to think about what is the step God has for you. God's calling you to get to the right side of the boat. You don't have to move that far. And he's saying, now cast out your nets. See what kind of blessings you will have to tow into the shore. You can't even get them into the boat. God is calling each and every one of us uh, to follow him, to be willing to take that new step, even come out of our comfort zone that we might be in in that routine of our faith, uh, to add something new, uh, to try a way to, to be drawn closer to him, to hear his voice, and to cast out our net. So I pray God would bless you as you think of that small step that he may be calling you to take this fall. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that your voice continues to call to us, that you continue to, to offer us uh, an invitation to cast out our nets. Lord, we are often hesitant, hesitant and we, we hold on to our nets 
we're not so sure about getting out of our comfort zone and our, our routine. And yet, Lord, I ask that you would just speak to us. Maybe you've already been speaking to everyone here and they've been kind of saying no and, and maybe it's not the right time. Would you speak clearly a call to go to that right side of the boat to cast out our nets and, and help us to see what you would do uh, with that offering that we give to you. Uh, we ask your blessing. We ask your, your voice to speak clearly to us. We pray this all in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.